Okay, uh, good morning, everybody. It is it's 8 a.m., so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, we Yeah, it looks like we're going to have a, a big group today. So welcome to uh, virtual seminars for Precambrian Geology after a, a week off. Um, give me a second. I've lost the tab that I need to be on. Okay, so today we're really excited to have uh, have Gordon loved uh, presenting for us. He's uh, he's head of uh, head of our department here at UCR now. Um, so he'll give us a rundown on um, on some organic geochemistry in a bit. I've been requested. It's been requested of me that I uh, by um, Oliver Strimpel, who who runs a a, a podcast called Geology Bites, um, and. Uh, so he wanted me to show everybody here some some of his podcast episodes are relevant to um, the Precambrian geology. So I'm going to show share my screen and show everybody the web the website he has. Um, there it is. Does everybody see? Let's see. Does everybody see geology bites here? Yeah, it looks good. Okay. So um, this is his website, and uh, so he does a podcast every week, and um, there you can find the podcasts on pretty much any uh, any podcast app or anything. But he suggests people uh, go onto his website. Here's one by Paul. Um, there's one further down. Rachel Rachel Wood did one. Um, let's see. We go to. Uh, Let's find there. Okay, let's just, I just want to show you uh, why it's probably a good idea to, it can be a good idea to make sure you watch on the website too. Um, so you can go to individual episodes and you can play the, the podcast from the website. And then he includes uh, podcast illustrations. So any figures that might be helpful images are all there and you can follow along. So he suggests, that this is the best way to uh, experience the podcasts. Um, so uh, that that little uh, with 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 just that little introduction to geology bites, maybe some of you would like to uh, to um, to subscribe to that. So um, with that, I'm just going to go ahead and get started. So today uh, we have our presentation by Dr. Gordon Love, and I'll introduce Gordon for us. Um, Gordon is a professor of geochemistry and chair of Department of Earth and Planetary Sciences at UCR. He's an organic geochemist who analyzes lipid biosignatures preserved in, sediment, in the sedimentary record, but with an emphasis on Proterozoic and Paleozoic biomarker records to track the evolutionary rise of eukaryotes, the protracted oxygenation of the ocean, and the biological impacts of mass extinctions. Today, he is going to talk about some of his work on assessing the most likely source of C30 stearines found in some, but not all neoproterozoic rocks, which is currently a hot topic. So he's gonna uh, present on this for um, about 45 minutes and we'll open for discussion um, and, we'll, uh, uh, and we'll go from there. So Gordon, thank you so much and take it away. Okay, thank you, Alex. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, thanks to the participants for, for zooming in here. So I'll begin today by acknowledging my co-authors on this work. Uh, Alex Zumberg is my former PhD student. Most of the data that I'll show today was generated by Alex during his PhD, a lot of which has been already published, but some hasn't. There's some new aspects in there. And then integral part of the collaboration was Paco Cardenas, who's a sponge biologist at Uppsala University with expertise in molecular phylogenetics and morphological uh, classification uh, of sponges. So this is a hot topic in the last couple of years, quite controversial. What are the major sources of neoprorozoic C30 stearines? And my arguments are going to be data-driven, right? Not opinion-driven, not wishful thinking-driven. So we usually always start with like a 10 minute little background 
on concepts in terms of lipid biomarkers, uh, rationale and methodology. So bear with me, we'll, we'll go through this in about 10 minutes. So lipid biomarkers, where do they come from? Most derive from biochemicals and cell membranes. They will have a stable core to them made of a hydrocarbon that's very resistant. And in rocks that have undergone a mild thermal history, these will be preserved. We'll also have functional groups in there to impart some sort of polarity contrast between one end of the molecule and another. Uh, but these are progressively lost through like, geological uh, maturation. So the example I give here is produced by diverse groups of bacteria, and it's this bacteria hopane tetral. The information we get from biomarker lipids, obviously we're interested in the biological inputs, right? What was the ecology at the time of deposition with different degrees of specificity. We can also get some information about the redox conditions of the environment. If we're looking at a marine or lacustrine setting and whether we're looking at unusual conditions of salinity. And then because we get alteration of lipids and we get stereochemical changes, as a function of increasing time and temperature, increasing thermal maturity. They have been used uh, by the oil industry, uh, basically to assess whether organic matter has reached what we call the oil window and broken down into fragments of oil and gas. And in fact, the whole field of biomarker geochemistry came out of oil exploration and using these for at least four decades as molecular fingerprints for oil source rock uh, correlations. So we often show this, it's an oversimplification of reality of what the geological fate of lipids, but it highlights well the most stable parts of the molecules. And for those that are not familiar with organic chemistry, these lines, line structures here, they're, they're very good at showing the core carbon skeleton of the molecule. Each line represents a covalent carbon-carbon bond. Each carbon atom's got a valency of four, so not the bonds that are not shown in are hydrogen atoms to make up a valency of four. And examples here are the hopanes, the stable hydro hydrocarbon core of the bacteria hopane polyols and steranes, a uh, variety of which are made by uh, different groups of eukaryotes from, from sterile precursors. But this precursor to hydrocarbon sort of schematic is an oversimplification of what happens in reality. In terms of sterines, they've been very useful at looking at the progressive change in the taxonomic affinities of primary producers in the ocean from the Proterozoic all the way through the Phanerozoic. But you have to realize that these are not source specific uh, compounds. Yes, red algae in some animals will have, often have C27 as a major sterol, but there'll be other sterol structures in there as well. Uh, from the cryogenic through the Paleozoic, the main algal sterene often has 29 carbon atoms with extra, two extra carbons in the side chain at the C24 position uh, here. But again, there are other, right? It's not a source specific uh, marker, but can still be very, very useful if you know the limitations of, of, the, of the selectivity of those. Uh, what I'm gonna talk about today is we, often find three sterene structures with 30 carbons, so three additional, uh, three additional carbons in the side chain. And these are derived from these sterile precursors. And what you'll find is we'll generally lose things like the alcohol groups and the double bonds, and it's the hydrocarbon cores. Yes, there's modifications that happen to these, but as you can see uh, in green here, this sterene structure, this what we call the NPC is related to sterile precursor A, the ones in blue are related to this one here, and the ones in red are related to that one here. And what we find is the three most commonly found neoprozoic C30 sterenes can all be made by demo sponges, and we'll come back to this. A more realistic, uh, but still simplified version of the overall geological fate of lipids and sedimentary organic matter is shown in this schematic here. Uh, because what happens is we don't just get free extractable compounds, we get incorporation into macromolecular fractions, high molecular weight fractions, 
And then at higher thermal maturity, right, as we begin to break down some of those polymers, we get released back into what we call the bitumen. The bitumen phase is free lipid biomarkers. A lot of what we call this bound lipids is present in a phase that we, that we term as, as kerogen. So kerogen is an immobile polymer, it's a solid. We use this a lot uh, in terms of our, our research group because we can access a much higher proportion of the biomarker pool. And it's also a very, very useful self-consistency check just to look to, to uh, verify whether we're looking at real, genuine neoprozoic markers or from younger contaminants that may have migrated in. And kerogen typically represents 95%, right? Of the organic matter, but it's rarely looked at by organic geochemists because it's more complicated to analyze than the stuff that's solvent extractable. So some recent work we've done, and uh, I'll come back to this slide again uh, during the talk, is organic geochemists don't even realize, most organic geochemists don't realize how rapid carriage information actually commences and is complete. It will begin in the water column, it will begin in the sediment surface. So we were working with uh, collaborators at NASA Ames Research, looking at the fate, the diagenetic fate of lipids from these microbial mat ecosystems from the Guerrero and Negro uh, salt ponds. There are active microbial layers in the first three layers, and then we look at the preservation of lipids in the underlying sediments. Looking at them as free compounds, it can be extracted and look at those bound into insoluble macromolecules or, or proto -kerogen. And amazingly, right, greater than 95% of the organic matter is already in the form of an insoluble phase after only a few years, 47 years of burial. So I'll come back and analyze and look, scrutinize this, this slide again. So we can't just report at face value what we're going out, especially if your analytical procedure is only based around looking at extractable uh, compounds. And yes, you'll do all the lab procedural blanks in case anything funky going on with the, with the reagents or anything like that. But most of the common contaminants that you'll get in Precambrian rocks are already in the samples, either as drilling fluid uh, constituents or from outcrop, right, that are pervaded in there. And the most common ones are extractable hydrocarbon compounds. So we have a number of uh, analytical procedures and self-consistency checks uh, that we'll routinely perform to right, check the veracity of, of the data we're actually uh, generating. And I would say out of all of these, the most rigorous self-consistency check is the analysis of kerogen bound biomarkers because it's immobile, it can't migrate into a sedimentary rock package. So how would you get the biomarker pool out of something that's high molecular weight, such as kerogen? Well, you have to break covalent bonds and you have to use a technique where you don't scramble the structures or scram scramble the stereochemistry. So I helped develop this, what we call this hydrogen pyrolysis technique or high pi during my PhD work. It's continuous flow method. So when you heat up samples with high pressure hydrogen gas, then we have a sweet gas that quickly removes these from the hot zone of the reaction. And we spent decades basically looking at the modifications that can happen during the technique with model compounds and with things like cultures. So you have to know your technique well that you're using, right, to get these, to access this bound technique. And so back in 2009, the sort of start, start of this here, we published this biomarker record from the Hook of Supergroup from the South Oman Salt Basin and finding an almost like high amounts, high, we're talking about what on, on average one to 4% of C30 compounds, 2% of which on average are what we call the 24 IPC compounds. So this got this isopropyl substituent at the 24 group here. It begins, the record begins actually in rocks which underlie the maranoan cap carbonate so somewhere in the cryogenian, and we find them in every formation all the way through the ED Akron and into the LA Cambrian. All this results in this record from South Oman was verified by the kerogen analysis. And at the time, we only knew about two compounds prior to Alex Zimberg's PhD work. Uh, 
we subsequently went in and recognized another series coming from another one compound that we call the 26 MES compound that Alex uh, verified. And this is another series of C30 stirrings that can be made from demo sponges. So, as I say, the focus of the talk today will be lipid biomarker data based. So this is the only slide I'm going to show, right, that has that mentions fossils. Leave the paleontologists to argue about those. And the only one that shows the molecular clocks. Suffice to say, a lot of the molecular clocks, multiple methods in the last 10 years, predict a neoprozoic origin of animals. Uh, so the likely origin of animal multicellular cellu cellularity by about 800 million years ago. And here's where a record of these two C30 stirring structures kicks in sometime in the, in the cryogenium. So into the meat of the talk is the next part. Neoprozoic C30 stirrings are these primary structures derived from biogenic C30 sterols or are they modified neoprozoic algal stains? We know the real neoprozoic signals because of the kerogen verification, but have we just added carbon atoms to algal stains to make the C30 from the C29? So uh, some background about this. For 24 IPC first identified by Mark McCaffrey, and co-workers, and then we published a series of papers on South Oman in 2009. And we find them not just from Oman, but in other locations as well. There's an age-selective spike of 24 IPC in the Neoprozoic to Cambrian in some, but not all rocks. And then later, 2018, Alex identified another series that could have, well, it can possibly be made by demo sponges. Uh, the side chain chemistry is a bit different, uh, as we'll see in, in subsequent slides here. This one here is quite unusual. It's got extra carbons at the end of the chain rather than at the C24 uh, position. So let me just try and minimize this. Yep, here we go. So what we'll generally find is three when they're present in neoprozoic oils and rocks. We'll find, we'll always find three different series of compounds. But the relative abundances can be very different from sample to sample. It's not the same signal all the time. And in some neoprozoidals, we don't find these at all. They're not detectable. Often the 24 IPC will be the main component here. So very high in this bag of wallet oil. So they've just got different side chain chemistry, but 30 carbon atoms in total. And we can analytically resolve these right, using capillary GC. And we use this quite selective, what we call MRM, GCMS technique uh, to monitor there because they're only a few percent of the total stereos. Important patterns to highlight from the outset, they're genuine neoprozoic biomarkers, so they're worth arguing about. They're found as free stereos and they're covalently linked into kerogen. The more we know about kerogen, that tells us that there are very there are primary biolipid structures or they're formed very early in diagenesis. As I say before, we don't just always see the same C30 background signal because that would be suspicious. There are wide variation in the relative abundances and the absolute abundances of C30s. And another really important result came from one of my other uh, PhD students, Kelvin Power. When we look at samples across the oligotrophic East European craton, despite having the high C29s, most of these samples don't have detectable C30. Right. So again, if it's a diagenetic artifact, why are we seeing these in, in some but not all uh, samples? So the question here is, right, we've got three. Are we looking at a selective pattern or are we looking at a scrambled pattern? Prior to Alex's PhD work, we only knew about two compounds and we didn't know whether there were other compounds in there that could have been co-looting. He helped identify this one here, and we'll see how we went about that as a 26 MES. So unless you know some of this information, it's hard to come up with right, the most parsimonious mechanism to explain the distributions 
So we started working with Paco on modern sponges. I have to say, he really helped drive uh, right, the selection strategy coming up with these. And we now know, right, from Alex and Paco's work, that there are different groups of demos that can make 24 IPC as their major, in this case, the top chromatogram, 90% of their total sterols as 24 IPC isomers. This one's got a double bond in the side chain, this one hasn't. And other groups of demo sponges that make the 26 ME as the main, right? As the main 99% of the sterols and in huge absolute amounts as well. Quite interestingly, some of these species have been are associated with living around auction minimum zones. And so they've thought to have a seasonal hypoxia tolerance. Whether the sterile uh, complement has got anything to do with that, we don't know. Anyway, really importantly for Alex, when we're characterizing these, looking for target stirrings to, to look for in, in the ancient rock records, it's a dual analytical approach, right? So he's looking them at directly as sterols, and he's looking at over 100 uh, specimens of modern sponges, and then converting the sterols into stirrings to see where they actually look. Can we resolve, right? How many series of resolvable stirrings are biogenic? How does this compare to the fossil record? And then in terms of the demos that make these the major, is this just random or are they phylogenetically related uh, species? So this shows why it's very important to look at both the sterols. You do the dual approach. You don't just convert them into hydrocarbons because at very, very low amounts, you might get small amounts as artifacts. But here we show there is a real 24 IPC sterile constituent here, right? At low amounts, but it's present in these Aplicina uh, genus uh, uh, demo sponges. This was the first finding of ternally methylated sterols. He's unusual back in the 1970s. What's quite interesting when, for people who are interested in trying to find neoprozoic spicules, in this aspiculate aspicul species, they produce both types of C30 that we find in the neoprozoic record. They produce both the 24 IPC and they produce the terminal methylated, and they don't produce uh, spicules. So at this stage, you can't really mention unconventional sterols in sponges without mentioning uh, this scientist here, Carl Gerasi from Stanford University who's pioneering in terms of the, the structural elucidation and biosynthesis of unconventional steroids, and he targeted sponges a lot of the time. Also very famous for his work on steroid hormones leading to the development of the oral contraceptive pill. And I always say uh, he's the original, most interesting uh, man in the world. So new results, what about, so we know that in terms of moderate amounts, there are many different species across the demo sponge tree in different groups that make 24 IPC. But what about the ones that make them as major? And by major, I mean 30 to 99% of the total sterols. And this was really down to Paco's input here. They can be the major sterile on what he thinks is a clade, phylogenetically related uh, species, but he's calling the top sentia clades. And he estimates there's over 100 species in this clade, and they can make them in huge absolute amounts as well. So back in the 1979, they knew there was these oddball like, occasional species that would turn up, having these as the major sterols, but we didn't know till now. But a lot of these that are making, right, a lot of the species that make them as major are actually phylogenetically related, and it's not just random synthesis. So an important result. Alex's work as well identified uh, that the 26 MES is an ancient uh, C30 stirring compound. So we started looking at the precursors uh, for this. And there are three different precursor compounds, and they just differ, they're double bond isomers. But because that double bond disappears during early diagenesis, then you'll end up producing the same. Uh, hydrocarbon core that you can find is 26 MES. 
So there are three different sterile precursors of this. So it's quite unusual in that they've got this methyl group added to the end of the chain to produce an extended side chain. So where would these allude? And we and what we did was we we found that these exactly colluded with the, the mystery series, right? That we couldn't identify. So uh, as I said before, we we knew about two series, but Alex, by generating these at 26 MES with good retention of the structure and stereochemistry, we could verify that that's actually what the third series actually were. So there are two major clades of demo sponge that makes these as major uh, sterile. So here, there's this Rhabdostrella geodia clade that make them in a sort of five to 15% of the total sterols. Uh, they also make unusual C29 compounds as well. And I'm generally interested, regardless of the implications for the neoprozoic record, I'm generally interested in natural products and how sponges can make these unconventional structures and what the functional role of these actually are in the cell membranes. So we looked a lot at the, the biosynthesis and you can get a lot of useful insights as to what's happening by looking at the whole sterile complements. And what you quickly realize is there's a strong sponge host control. Yes, there's a lot of microbial symbionts, but they're really coordinating and controlling the position of the double bond in the side chain because those are the route to methylate and add extra carbons to the side chain. So the geodia species that make conventional sterols will have generally have this C28 as a major compound sterile, and then it can add additional carbons at this 24 position here. While the geodia species that make the unconventional with a lot of thermally methylated ones will produce a very, very different C28 compounds. And we can predict right, which species are going to make conventionals and which ones are going to make unconventional uh, sterols. Another one that wasn't realized, and this might be hard to, to imagine, but prior to Alex's work, if you look at these like Rhabdostrella or any species that makes a lot of unconventional sterols, if you actually sample them from different geographic localities, do they make the same sterile complement or are they different depending on what the, the ecology is at the local site? So we, we looked at the sterile assemblages from three different specimens from Taiwan and three specimens from the Great Barrier Reef from three distinct uh, locality, reef localities. And they've got a very, very similar uh, distribution of compounds. Again, right, it's strong evidence that the whole sterile complement and the sterile composition and the cell membranes are controlled by the, the sponge host. There may be a role of symbionts that are vertically inherited by those. It's not well constrained, but overall the sponge host appears to control the overall sterile distributions. So as well as having C30s, they go all the way up here to like C31 compounds as well. So going back, what we know, We've added a lot more to our knowledge about target compounds to look for in the rock records. But given what we know is, uh, is commonly found in the, in the Ediacaran record, for example, in the LA Cambrian, are we looking at complicated mixtures? Are we looking at selective compound distributions? And again, this couldn't be evaluated till Alex had done his, uh, his piece of research. How many C30 stirring compounds are biogenic? How many possible permutations could be from diagenetic scrambling of the side chain? And can we actually resolve these as separate compound series? So as I said before, prior to Alex's PhD work, we only knew about two compounds. What he's actually shown is that there are up to six resolvable biogenic C30 stirrings, but only three are commonly found and the cryogenic Ediacaran and early Cambrian. So only a small subset of all the structural permutations. It's a very selective pattern. And what we know is if you actually add carbons to different positions in the side chain, then we can actually analytically resolve these. It was important to know. They don't all co-loop. 
There's a general pattern. The more carbons you add to interior positions, the earlier they'll look, and the more carbons you add to the end of the chain, the later they'll look. But six different biogenic C30 stirrings from Alex's work. If you think about adding non-selectively three extra carbons, then the amount that could be made by diagenetic scrambling, right, from long-term geological sort of alteration will be much greater than six. So when we go back and look at this, we're looking at a very selective distribution of all the structural permutations. And this is one powerful line of evidence that these are actually primary structures. And we'll also see more evidence for that when we delve into the and scrutinize uh, the data, the original data. This 24 NPC can be made by sponges, but it can also be have a protus origin. So we've generally focused on the IPC MES, but it's important to realize that all three could be made by demo sponges. So the other series, right, of compounds, the biogenic ones are not routinely uh, showing up, at least in the, in the cryogenic and EDAC and early Cambrian. So what are the competing hypotheses? And it's really sort of, Right, become a bit controversial in the last couple of years. Uh, so obviously there's the idea of the primary origin coming from C30 sterile producers, and we would argue that demo sponges are the most likely source of those. But there's other ones worth uh, considering. The side chain methylation of C29 algal steroids from long-term geological alteration has been proposed quite recently. We've thought about this for a while. And then the idea that maybe you could bacterially methylate sterols or make these from microbial sources de novo. Uh, there was this one paper that came out, and this is what we call the team anything but sponge. And this is the first, the first stab in 2019. It was all about unicellular rhizaria, right? Not just coming from animal source, but they could find these uh, small amounts of C30 sterines and their hydrogenation products from, from different rhizaria. So now they've more or less ditched this idea and they've moved on to an, an alternative alternative. So the C30s they're finding tend to be right, very, very trace amounts in most of them here. Uh, importantly, they never performed any sterile analysis. They're not directly detecting these. And what we know from their more recent papers in 2020, C30s can be formed as artifacts through from this catalyst, what we call the Adams catalyst that they use. And they can account for all the C30s that they're actually finding in their products. So without directly detecting these, then we don't know, right? But rise in, it's very, very unlikely. Even if these were real products, right, C30s, they're there at two to three orders of magnitude, less than they actually show up in the rock record. So they can't really be considered a major source. And it's doubtful that either the 24 IPC or the 26 MES are widespread and abundant in Rhizaria. So what I actually find here, the C30s we've found around here, because their method, they're only using right, hydrogenation conversion. And we know that their method produces artifacts, converts 29 into small amounts of 30. All the 30s that they find could just be artifacts from that. So a rigorous, that's why we use this dual analytical approach. When we say that a particular demo sponge species makes a particular unconventional, it has been verified by direct style analysis. They are not doing that here, right? It lacks rigor. And we know that from the photosynthetic rhizarians already by studying the biosynthesis and the whole sequential methylation, adding more carbons to the side chain. We know for the carcassones, these are the photosynthetic rhizarians, that the major 28 and 29 positions of the double bond are not conducive to adding like, extra carbons. That's not gonna happen. We can tell, right, that that won't happen. You get a very, very different double bond position if you're, right, if you're gonna end up with terminally methylated. And again, there's no evidence that the 26 MES or 24 are actually primary sterols from any rise area. And I think the, auth the authors here have more or less ditched this in favour of another alternative. So in 2019, it was all about rise area, quickly forgotten. 
But the idea that you can transform C29 steroids into C30 is something that should be, right, that's much more plausible and should be taken seriously. And we, we did all the way back to 2009. And the analogy we'll make, we know about this, we've known about these for decades, is you can add extra carbon to the positions in the A-ring. Here, two and three position. We routinely monitor these in our methods. Uh, and we've known about these since the 1970s. But we know that the reactivity at these two and three positions in the A-ring is way more reactive than the positions in the side chain because double bonds in the side chain of sterols are rapidly reduced during early stages of diagenesis. You need a functional group in there to provide a reactive center to add additional carbons. So your opportunity for adding extra carbons to the side chain should be limited to, extra, to very early stages of diagenesis. But it's something as a mechanism that should be, should be considered. Is this feasible? We're not so naive to think we don't modify structures over hundreds of millions of years. But as we'll see, I think the data, when we scrutinize the data, this doesn't seem to be the driving mechanisms. I'm sure you can produce these in very, very low amounts, but finite. But in places like Oman, East Siberia, we're seeing signal that's way, way beyond a sort of common background signal. So importantly, any mechanism should have to explain the selectivity of the C30 compounds that we find and the abundance patterns and the age selective patterns. So more recent, 2020, it's all about this is the latest uh, idea. So I'll say from the outset that what they did here was heat up sterile model compounds in a sealed tube, small sealed tube, for many hours at high temperature. I think this is a flawed approach for either simulating diagenesis or cathogenesis. Why does it not simulate diagenesis? The temperatures are way too high, right? They're not anywhere 50, 60 degrees maximum. We don't have hydrogenation going on during the pyrolysis. So we're going to maximum, right? We're going to exaggerate the amount of secondary chemistry that's going on. It doesn't simulate catagenesis because you've got reactional functional groups and high temperatures, a combination you would never get during maturation in the rock record. So again, we'll go scrutinize the data. As you'll see, very, very bold title of these papers. So if the game is to try and convince the non-specialists who don't want to delve into the gory details, then there's something you can cite quite easily. It's not my style, but I suppose tactically it might be effective. One thing that comes out, right, of this paper from this Van Maldigan paper, if there's no double bonds in the precursor, they get no significant carbon addition. We get no conversion of 29 into 30. And regardless of what algal sterile precursor you're talking about, that's going to happen anyway, just through hydrogenation during diagenesis. It's going to stabilize the side chain. So the conditions that they use will exaggerate the amount of side chain chemistry. And yet what they find is a very complex, non-selective distribution, different right, to what we find in the ancient records, and also fail in terms of the abundance Right, the orders of magnitude out are too low in terms of the yields of, of compounds. So, case in point from the Van Maldigan paper mimics early animal signatures. This is what they're actually finding. So, we said before there's up to three possibilities actually found in the neoprozoic records when they're actually there or they're undetectable. What they're finding here, I can count at least nine different compounds, right? Most of which do not show up in the record. So this is the driving mechanism, and this is what they're simulating. Why do these other compounds not show up in the record? Okay, they make a match here with this compound, right? This 26 MES is one of the compounds. Job done, right? Matching up, cherry pick peaks. But why do these other compounds not show up if this is the driving mechanism? So other thing we find is huge amounts of rearranged diastamines that don't turn up in the record as well. So they're not mimicking the ancient patterns. Obviously not, right? We look at these, we delve in and these papers come out and people go, oh, have you seen this paper? 
Like we couldn't believe that this gets through review, right? How does that mimic the selectivity of the three compounds that we actually see routinely? The other one where it falls down is look at the abundances, right? On average, one to 4%, two orders of magnitude deficient in the amount. And yet they're using pyrolysis conditions in the lab that actually exaggerate the amount of side chain chemistry. So here's the problem, right? If you're going to convert 29 into 30, when you try and ramp up the yield, all you're going to do is produce a more and more complicated distribution that will be more and more different to what we actually find in the ancient rock records. So these don't mimic the selective Oman patterns that we find, regardless of what the titles of the papers say. So does, that, does this messy oscilloscope trace look like what we actually find in the rock record, high selectivity, three compounds, often very, very high selectivity to IPC and orders of magnitude deficient from what they're getting from their heating experiments. We'll come back and look at this uh, slide again. So we decided to go back and have a fresh look at the data that we generated in 2009. Is there any correlation with the extent of diagenetic alteration in terms of the C30? stirring content and distribution. We have a fresh look at published data. So I want my arguments to be, right, to be based on the scrutiny of the data. So what we show in this cross plot here, 44 rock samples covering 90 million years of time from the Nafun and Ara groups. On the y-axis, a measure of the C30 stirring content as reference to the main stirring, which is the C29. On the x-axis, just to Understand, we looked at those A-ring, right? Those commonly formed A-ring methyl stigma stains, which is a measure, right? It gives you a tangible measure of the extent of diagenetic carbon addition to the molecule. What we can see is there's no correlation at all, right? From the R squared value between the C30 stirring content just for the Oman samples with the extent of A-ring methylation. There is no correlation with the extent of diagenetic modification. We find that all ancient rocks, because they all contain an alcohol group initially in the A ring, will contain A ring methyl stearines, regardless of their C30 stearine content. And not all ancient samples contain C30 stearines, even if they contain abundant C29s. A very, very important uh, distinction or a very, very important piece of the puzzle. So that, what we then did was add in more samples from different locations from the Ediacaran. And these again are rocks thermally immature with high C29. And what we find is, right, we don't fill in space, extra space on the x-axis, but we fill in more of the y-axis. So when you go to places like East European Craton and places like Russia and Ukraine, we'll have high C29s, but most of the samples the C30 stirring content is below detection limits. So these are all the right, data points here in silver. To try and assess what any, what a common background signal might be from diagenesis, we also looked at Paleozoic samples of different maturity, different lithologies, and these are in orange here from Ordovician Silurian. Again, they're occupying the same range, 10 to 30% gets converted into these E-ring methyl derivatives through diagenesis, but there's no correlation with the extent of C30, right? So we can clearly see, right, the abundance is an, an Oman that we reported back to is order of magnitude above those found in the Ediacaran from Baltica and from the Ordovician. Even assuming these all come from diagenetic alteration, there's an abundance separation in terms of the C30 stirring content. That's about abundance. What about the selectivity of the C30 stirrings? So what we're doing here is measuring the IPC NPC ratio against the C30 stirring content. So what we're saying here is if the geological alteration is a driving mechanism, you're going to have to do more alteration of 29 to drive up the C30 yields. And you expect a more complex distribution of compounds and a messier like chromatogram. What we actually find. And so if you take this OMR27 compound here, yes, it's an outlier. If you take that away, that correlation goes away. 
But what we can quickly see is it's a complete opposite pattern. The samples with the highest C30 stirring content out of all the Omans is the, one of the most pristine. It's not one of the most altered. It comes from one of the most thermally immature, and it's got the highest selectivity out of all 44 samples for IPC as the major one. This is what is expected for primary signals, not from altered signals. So in terms of the scrutinizing the abundance and the selectivity, there's an obvious spike of 24 IPC, as we originally suggested in our 2009 papers. Thanks to Roger Summons Lab, uh, MIT, as well as our MRM to complement that, we use a different technique, what we call the triple Q. It's a more selective way of looking at C30 stirrings, especially when you get down to very, very low amounts. And what we're seeing here, there are two different end members. The top two we consider here as very strong signals, strong being two or 3% of the C29 content as, as IPC, all right, the IPC here, with very, very light, high selectivity. And we would consider it as a primary signal. And it's very, very different in terms of the abundance and in the compound profile compared to something where it might just be the low amount, might be a diagenetic background signal. So it should be, should be fairly straightforward to come up with thresholds, uh, ratios and abundances that would distinguish these two different scenarios. Right, so here from these St. Petersburg area in Russia, we've got most of the signal is actually not real C30 signal, it's just crosstalk of other compounds. What happens is if, if you crash the real signal, eventually you start seeing small amounts of other compounds coming through. And way more than three major series, and way more than six, right, of the potential biogenic ones. So that's a red flag that something's going on. Yes, you could match up some peaks to be these three here, but there are definitely contributions from other compounds to these, to these peak areas. And it'd be unwise to report these as a real 24 IPC signal. The profiles are very, very different and they'd be distinguished on their abundance as well. So primary origin, the pros, right? Well, demo sponges can account for the three most common C30 stains we find in the record. There are very like, obvious age selective and regional patterns. Cons, there's some degree of alteration is inevitable through hundreds of millions of years of burial. But we should be able to right, distinguish what could be a background diagenetic signal from a strong primary signal. The diagenetic origin of the neoprozoic C30 is something that has to be considered very, very seriously, and we do, especially very early diagenesis for those functional groups still in the side chain. But scrutinizing the data, it doesn't explain the age selective patterns, particularly the high abundance of 24 IPC and 26 MES in some but not all, right, neoprozoic to Cambrian rocks. There is no correlation with tangible measures of the amount of diagenetic alkylation. And then something is also very, very important is from looking at structures of green algal sterols, we can predict other series of C30s that should be there. For example, if you've got a 20 position, if you've got a double bond at the 22 position in the side chain, you could have 22 and 23 methyl derivatives that should be resolvable, and yet they don't turn up in the markets. Not, why not? I would say that's because this is not explaining the record that we find in places like Oman and East Siberia. The analogy I'll make with what we're actually finding with a high spike of 24 IPC in certain places and neoprozoic to early Cambrian is with this, which this peak here or this compound that appears in Devonian and Younger. It's a C30 series. We start seeing above a noisy baseline a very, very simple distribution of compounds. It's 24 NPC dominated. And it coincides with uh, the rise of pelagophyte algal ancestors in the Lake Devonian. It will be viewed as a primary signal, non-controversial by most all organic geochemists. So when we see a very, very similar thing happening in Oman, very different to other places like East European, surely we're looking at the same thing. We're looking at the biogenic, biogenic enrichment of a primary signal with high selectivity and high abundance. As I say before, this rock here, 
It's thermally immature. It's not been altered. There's not a lot of rearranged isomers in here. Uh, and it's one of, one of, of not the most pristine signal we can actually find in, in our Oman data set. So in places like that, the abundances and the distributions are more likely governed by primary biogenic inputs. So any mechanism has to explain the relative abundances and selectivity and the age selective patterns. And multiple lines of evidence strongly favor a primary origin rather than geological alteration. So that tells us it's probably biogenic, it doesn't necessarily tell us it's sponge origin, but just to reiterate some of the arguments for why sponges uh, are appealing in terms of uh, their characteristics. They're proven to make the 24 IPC and 26 MES as major membrane sterols. They can also be a source of the 24 NPC, the other one that's found. The Rhizarian result in 2019 is a red herring. Uh, bacterial sources, not just sponge symbionts should be investigated, but I don't see how that's going to explain the age selective patterns and the paleogeographic patterns. And overall, the unconventional sterols, they can be useful chemotaxonomic markers for, uh, for demo sponges. So again, the three common ones when they are detected in the neoprozoic records, there are, right, all the sterile precursors ex exist in the demo sponge uh, across different species. So ongoing and future work with this, I say is like, instead of trying to mimic diagenesis in the lab by heating model compounds up, in a closed system at high temperature. Because the opportunity for carbon addition should happen early, why don't we go out and test this in modern sedimentary environments? And the first place we've done that are benthic mats from the Guerrero Negro salt ponds. And these are the added advantage of producing lots of like kerogen bound and free C29 compounds. So we could test whether 29 has been converted into C30 in these mat ecosystems during diagenesis. And we continue to look at very interested in unconventional sterile synthesis and sponges. Uh, to end this part of the talk, just this quite really interesting result from Guerrero Negro. Not surprisingly, right, as I said before, most of this is kerogen after a few years. The major stirrings are C29. As we hypothesized, the two and three methyl, the A-ring ones, are made during very, very early diagenesis, 16% is at the levels that you'll find in the ancient records. But the important thing is we aren't finding C30 stirrings despite, right? Despite the A-ring series being there, we're not finding the IPC or 26 MES. This tells me two things. 29 steroids are not being converted into C30 in any appreciable amounts. And in this particular MAT ecosystem, none of the eukaryotes, none of the bacteria are actually biosynthesizing these C30 stirring compounds. So we'll continue to look in other modern sedimentary environments. Finally, for the last five minutes or so, I just want to talk about, so people ask me about this Dickinsonia. If we're talking about Ediacaran markers, possible markers for animals, uh, just my views on, on this paper. Are these genuine Ediacaran sterines? How selective a marker is colistane for animals from first principles? So they claim in the, in the abstract that the biomarkers unambiguously clarify their phylogeny, bold claim. So first principles, colistane is not a source selected marker for animals. What we're gonna see within the data is enormously immature stirrings and rocks that are not suitable for detailed biomarker analysis. They're an order of magnitude below the threshold we would ever use for conducting ancient biomarker analysis, even for fairly immature rocks. And then within their own data, they've got anomalous immature sterine isomer ratios that point to younger sterine contamination. So lots of I've got lots of problems with this paper. If you go to the sections that they used, right, the mean TOC value almost undetectable, mean 0.01%, order of magnitude below the absolute minimum we would ever consider. It's a problem if your nitrogen content is higher than your TOC content. 
it's probably indicating nitrogen metabolite breakdown products from more recent organic matter. There are routes through all the sections, tracts and fissures. There is water, groundwater, uh, percolating all the way through the, the sections. Uh, we get fresh water with humic acids and other uh, organic components percolating throughout the surface uh, of the outcrop. So not ideal, especially given the very, very organic lean rocks that you're dealing with in the first place. So they got this uh, figure as a main figure. It's very, very complicated. So given what we've seen in terms of the TOC contents, the high nitrogen and the pictures from the outcrop, and we've got samples from the outcrop, uh, first of all, what I'd be saying is if you're actually going to go ahead and use these for biomarker analysis, make sure you're not seeing suspicious immature features, right, given what we've just seen. So have a look at the bulk extract properties and the stirring characteristics in the bulk extracts before you start over-interpreting what you're finding in the fossil specimens. So let's zone in on this. This five beta is an immature, very, very immature isomer. And they're producing in gray here, 50 samples, enormously high amounts of the five beta isomer that's thermodynamically unstable for something that's been buried for over 500 million years. And a huge range of values as well. So this should be controlled by thermal maturity. Given what we know, right, they should actually, for rocks of this age and this maturity, they should be plotting near the origin. They all, from both sections that they use, the values are too high and they, right, they're spread over large range of values here, highly suspicious from the outset. That you've got patterns that are too immature to have undergone 550 million years of burial. And they're most likely, the sterines have a high input of younger contaminants. So that's fine, that's the bulk extracts. What's the evidence that this contamination reaches and actually invades the fossil specimens themselves? Well, this was an earlier paper, this Beltanella formus that they interpret as cyanobacterial, so not coming from animal fossil. And yet they're still seeing this anomalous, like huge ratios of five beta to five alpha, greater than two. Right, in these in these rock in the fossil specimen, right? So we've got that in the microalgal film and in the actual fossil specimen itself. There's also a mismatch in the maturity profile between the whole pains and the stones. So the previous papers undermine the Dickinsonia paper results. So what should the ratios be for highly immature, right? What should the five beta to five alpha ratio be? And we've got good constraints on that and very immature pre all window ediacrin biomarkers from Russia. So this is less mature rock than what you find in this, and they're only, right, 0 0.3. They're not between 0 0.5 and 2. And then the main authors, the two main authors on the Dickinsonia paper, Jochen and Ilya, were actually co-authors on this other paper that show a very, very similar result to what we found, right? Five beta to five alpha ratios in less mature rocks of about 0.3. So when you move to a more mature uh, rock, as in the White Sea, the ratios of five beta shouldn't be any higher than that. They should be lower, they should be near the origin. So very, very suspicious given what we know about elemental uh, analysis and then the evidence that there's younger organics percolating through this outcrop. Or outcrops. The other one that they say in the abstract that's misleading, Dickinsonia and its relatives solely produce cholesteroids. Let's look at the sterine uh, distributions they actually find in the fossil specimens. Five out of eight Dickinsonia have higher C29 sterines than C27, and both Andiva have higher C29 than C27. So how do you get, right, C29 stigmatin up to 76%? How do you come up with this conclusion? It requires a lot of assumptions and it requires a lot of signal manipulation to back, subtract out the faunal contribution. And of course, if from this, the specimen itself, 
there's green algal, sterine, then the faunal contribution to the, the actual fossil specimen signal is, must be very, very low. The other one is just the general first principle rationale. Even if there was a colistane excess in these, they're not selective animal markers anyway from first principles, right? And then this pre starting C27 staring predominance has been interpreted differently by the same group of authors. They would describe these to unicellular eukaryotes, not animals, when they're found in Tonian rocks, but when they're found in Ediacaran biota, there is the, the 27 excess is ascribed to an animal origin. It's inconsistent log logic. And things like red algae can produce 27 as a major. It's not just animals. So cholesterols are not selective animal markers. So overall, right, in terms of this paper, there are many problems with it. The most important one is it doesn't provide strong independent evidence either way for Dickinson being an animal or not being an animal. And the first principle logic of using colistane C27 cholesteroids, uh, especially since the same group of authors have interpreted these in older rocks as being from unicellular eukaryotes. So that's me finished. What I'll do, and I'll take I'll have time to take questions. I'll, I can I can stay logged in for for another twenty minutes or so if people want to ask some questions. Yeah, thanks, Gordon. This is great. Um, so we will start the uh, the question session discussion session. As Gordon said, if we, he needs to go in maybe 20 minutes or so. So ask them in person by raising your hand or typing a star in the chat or type them and I can ask it for you. Um, but we're good to go for questions. Maybe you convinced everybody, Gordon. <laughs> oh, it looks oh, yeah. like uh, I think Paul's got his hand up. Hand Paul's got his hand up. Go ahead, Paul. Uh, yeah, yeah, I um, oh, uh, Greg. that was fantastic, um, Gordon. Um, I have problems with the Bobrovsky paper as well. My main question for you is: Is your critique that you presented here published? No, I mean we're putting together. Uh, and in terms of the the critique of the Dickinsonia work, no, yes. I mean I'm, I'm sort of blacklisted as being a reviewer on their papers uh, <laughs> or conflict of interest inverted commas. But yes. I think that paper could have done with uh, more rigorous reviews. It would have helped everyone. Um, you, you are aware, of course, that the, the same cholesterol is found in lots of fungi. It's just not found in uh, dicarian fungi, the modern ones but it's found in almost all the primitive fungi as well. Yeah. Well, it's found in a lot of eukaryotic lineages. Right. And like, the other thing is like when they're trying to, the, the language in the abstract implies that when they, they take a Dickinsonia specimen, they're seeing 27 as a major. That's not, even, that's not even the raw signal they're seeing. They're making assumptions that there's underlying algal mats. Right. They're deconvolution. There's no weighting to relative TOC content. There's no weighting to relative algal mat thickness. Mm -hmm. So how can how can they come up with an how can they come up with an estimate of ninety five to one hundred percent of the sterols in the faunal contribution is C twenty seven? For me, right, it's just suspiciously too precise, and when it should be really really inaccurate, because yeah, the amount of organic matter should determine right from specimen to specimen. There shouldn't be like a mixing model that accurately predicts that. Right. My, my reading of the paper also is that as the Dickinsonias got bigger and um, therefore older, um, there was actually less of an algal signature, signature and more of an animal signature as they interpret it. Yeah. Um, that doesn't sound to me like an animal that is getting fouled by algae. It sounds more like um, a lichen that is regulating the algal symbiont. 
Yeah, so how I consider, I think it's quite, if you go to, first of all, when you're selecting samples for Precambrian work, if your whole outcrop is compromised by contamination, then those are not good target samples. Right. And what I see, the danger is that these, especially since a lot of these, like Dickinsonia, they're impressions, where things like sandstones meet finer grain clays, these can be traps. If there's recent organic matter percolating through the outcrop, these can act as traps. There'll be mul multiple episodes of that happening. There'll be multiple sources of recent organic matter. And so any heterogeneity doesn't, right? Right, right. Doesn't no, necessarily, I, I, that, that's, that's not... Your point, your point is well taken, and, yeah. and there are boreholes through all of that stuff. Yeah. So there's, there is a potential to get really pristine material, which brings to me to my comment on the pear et al paper, which uh, it, would, would you hazard a guess that the lack of sponge biomarkers in the Vendian shales may indicate that it's freshwater instead of marine? It seems so different from the Oman spectrum. <clears throat> Uh, that's a good point. There are, we have got independent biomarker proxies that a lot of the Kotlin is actually a deltaic environment. Right. But we also find there are, uh, within that data set, there are samples that have got, they're not all absent, not all samples are the absent. There are some where we're seeing, uh, we're seeing occurrences in Russia and Ukraine of genuine 24 IPC and genuine 26 MES. Mm -hmm. But we definitely think there are, <laughs> that the that the, the Kotlin interval probably goes to a, a deltaic environment with a lot more fresh water input. Right. And that's coming completely, that's that's based on other biomarker proxies. Yes. That's not based on, on what you're saying. That's an independent biomarker proxy that's used by the oil industry for distinguishing sort of salinity of the aquatic depositional environment. Well, thanks so much. It was great. Thank you. All right, we've got a lineup of four more questions in order. Paul, then Ava, then Susanna, and then Mallory. So Paul, go ahead. Yeah, let Ava go ahead. Uh, my question's not that important. Okay, Ava said, hi Gordon, great talk. Do you think it's ever going to be possible to extract biomarkers from Ediacaran biota? Uh, I consider them as potential traps. If you if you got an outcrop that's contaminated, they're potential potentially trapping recent organic matter. Again, like let's go back. What I'd have liked to have seen with the Dickinsonia paper was let's look at the main molecular constituents in this film that's associated with the Dickinsonia. Other suspect other like sterols and functionalized compounds that would be very suspicious of recent, but they just selectively report certain steroids. I'd like to have seen that. Plus, as well, how much of the organic matter in the Dickinsonia associated with these films in the Dickinsonia are kerogen and macromolecular? That would be the bet, right? That would be a safer bet in terms of extracting out soluble organic matter, but maybe. With the caveats that there could be contam like more, more inf influence from contaminant contributions, and then separately analysing the kerogen that's associated with the Ediacaran biota could be a way uh, of getting a more robust signal. Hopefully that answers the question. Yeah. Yeah, usually we'll speak up if it didn't, so. Okay, Susanna, your hands raised. Would you like to unmute yourself and go? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Gordon. That was a great talk. Um, I have lots of questions, but uh, the, the main one I'll ask is you mentioned at the end that um, I think with the Oman biomarkers, you said that uh, there are structures where um, that include the precursors, the structures that sponges make today as precursors. I just, I'm not sure I understood what you meant. Do you mean in the biosynthesis pathway, you see some of the intermediary molecules that are are preserved? And I, I thought that was interesting because I, I guess I assumed that they would um, be transient since they're just, you know, in the process of being made to the final product. Yeah, there was, there was sort of two aspects to that. It was 
one, it was to help us understand the biosynthesis of these, because when you add extra carbons to the side chain and you're adding three extra carbons to a 27 precursor, you're not adding three at once, you're adding them one carbon at a time. Mm -hmm. So by looking at the whole series of 27, 20, 28, 29, 30, we get to see how the double bond is controlled and that becomes the reactive center for for used in tandem with methylation enzymes to add extra carbons. So that's what I'm talking about. We get an idea about the biosynthetic mechanisms by which sponges make them. Uh, in terms of like tracking some of these uh, compounds, it's, it's difficult because we, the, 20, the, the 29, 28, 27 are just dominated by things like algal, algal signal. The reason that the C30s are quite attractive is because, right, when you look at neoprozoic and early Paleozoic stuff, there's much less algal C30 stirring, so it's much easier to distinguish these, right, away from them. They just get swamped by algal, algal signal in practice. We're having a look for some of the unusual C29s from the terminally methylated ones because we can resolve those. And yes, you can convince yourself, right, if you want to play the games of... I can peak match, but I'm not sort of convinced that it's not just other complicated structures that we, we don't know exactly what they are and just call it. But we are looking at, to sort of move this forward, there's a possibility of using C31 compounds as well, because a variety of those are made by demo sponges. And then we also find sort of small amounts of C31s in, in the rock records as well. And then there are other there were other uh, what I'd call demo sponge features to the sterian distributions in Oman that are quite unusual. High amounts of C26 compounds, which I think are dietary breakdown products, yeah. right? They're using dietary sterols and they're modifying them, but they're making un unusually high amounts of those. Again, so when we wrote up the 2009 paper, tactically we thought, shall we put this in? And there's a section on this in the SI. But given that's not the only possible source of those compounds, we're like, we're just going to run into problems with reviewers to mention that. But what we actually found is with some of these Topsentia clade demo sponges that make huge amounts, right, of this, the IPC precursors, they're also making the precursors in huge amounts of the C26 sterines that we also find in the record, which is quite interesting. So. Uh, that could be other, looking for other compounds, uh, other target compounds is another way of showing that up. But my view is like, we have to scrutinize the data and things should not just be taken off the table uh, easily when we've put this amount of work in it and we know that they're genuine neoprozoic compounds. I think there's ways of having threshold values, as we did with IPC, NPC ratios, to distinguish a diagenetic background from a, a real abundant primary signal. And we're sort of always doing that with biomarkers anyway, right? Like you want to see an enhancement in terms of abundance and selectivity to be confident that it could be a primary signal. So it's easy, to, I mean, it's easy to pick threads with things like that, but I'm just trying to get to the most parsimonious explanation for this age selective spike in the neoprozoic to Cambrian. And I just see it as a very unusual situation. We also find what's quite interesting as well, we found in the Phanerozoic co occurrence of demo sponge spicules with the 24 IPC and the 26 MES. And the occurring Permian siliceous limestones uh, with lots of sponge spicules in them. So it's not the case that we only find. Right, these in the neoprozoic cambrian, and they never turn up with spicules. We actually find anomalous amounts of these in the phanerozoic turning up with demo sponge spicules. Okay, not a lot, right? Only one, one place in China, but there is a phanerozoic example, right, of that happening. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Gordon, here's another one in the chat. Mallory Brown says, hi, Gordon. It's really interesting that many of the sponges that make a lot of IPC MES live near OMZs. Are there, are, are there any other hypotheses for the physiological role of these C30s in sponges that you like? Yeah, that's a good question. And what I, what I always get in one week, like if we're 
let's be honest, we don't really know the functional role, but we, the usual, uh, the usual answers are things like, we want to shore up the membranes. Uh, so take a step back, dissection experiments on demo sponges that make huge amounts of 24 IPC were done by the Jurassic group in the eighties. And they're definitely associated as membrane sterols in different sponge cell types for sure. And then, but the, the thing is, so people then say, well, is this, this could be a chemical defense mechanism where you want to harvest the nutritional benefit of having all these symbionts without the symbionts taking over the host. And that's sort of fine, it sounds plausible, but at the same time, there are many demo sponges with huge amounts of symbionts that just make conventional sterols as well. So you can always provide counter arguments. Another idea is they could be protection of cell membranes against toxic compounds, membranolytic, that would break down the membrane, either by the host itself or by predators or by the microbiome of, of the symbiont. So yeah, it's, it's all conjecture about what, what the functional role of these actually is. Paco was gonna, Paco had an idea of like feeding membranolytic toxic uh, components to, to demo sponges part of a grant proposal uh, to test the functional role. All right. So the other, the other thing I want, the other thing I want to stress, because especially for people who are involved in molecular clocks, is the top sensia clade. Yeah, the species are phylogenetically related, and that's very important. But I just, I just know what's coming around the corner because it predict a lot of what came out of the, the team anything but sponge output, and I just see this someone, someone's going to produce a paper saying. The top sensia clade didn't diverge to the Phanerozoic, so that shows that that doesn't match with the Neoprozoic stirring record. There are more than one clade that make 24 IPC in demo sponges, right? Let's get that clear. It's not confined to the top sensia clade. It's just that out of the modern sponges, they are phylogenetically related and they make lots of them and they make lots of. Uh, Right, they make lots of like, like the 24 IPC. In terms of whether the sterols get anything to do with helping these survive in oxygen minimum zones, again, that's speculative, right? We'd have to, it's quite interesting uh, that they've been associated. Uh, and then the other thing is the major clade that makes 26 MES are the geodia that are found in the Arctic sponge grounds. They also make huge amounts of sponge biomass, right? That actually make so people often say, you've just seen too much, too much signal for that to be sponge, right? So that's often because people don't realize we're only looking at a few percent of the total signal, but they're saying still, why would you see these showing up if they're if they're not algal and they're actual? But what were two things? These unconventional sterols can be made in huge, absolute amounts per unit weight of biomass. Uh, and then also the amount of biomass in these sponge grounds can be can be pretty large and like the Arctic, the Arctic sea environments for the geodia ones. Internally, it's quite interesting. Some of these geo, geo, geodia and the ones that live around OMZ, internally they're completely anaerobic. There's things like sulfate reducers living in them in, term, in, in compartments in the sponges. So I hope that sprawling answer helps to, uh, helps to, to cover that. Well, Gordon, I know you said you had time constraints. It's 9.19, but there's one more get, question from the summons yeah. lab. Yes. Okay, Ju it says Juliana from the summons lab here. You mentioned that uh, the atoms catalyst used in hydrogenation adds artifact C30s. Bobrovsky uses a modified catalyst PTO2C uh, over C instead. Would you also add the artifact? Would that also add the artifact? Yeah, it does. He shows it in the supplement of his 2020 paper. It's in there. It's in there. The amount. And what's really worrying for them is 
uh, what's really worrying for them is that the amount of cattle issues determines the amount of artifact that they get. And the Nettershine paper used more of the catalyst, right, in the earlier paper. So who knows how much of the C30s in the Nettershine paper, right? So if you actually dealt, look at the SI section in Ilya's 2020 paper, it will, it will have from C29 sterile precursors, small amounts of C30 coming from his modified Adams catalyst method. He will argue that it's it's really that they've minimized the amount of catalyst, but it can still account for it, right. They're, they're still producing finite amounts of C30 artifacts. So Paul's Paul's got an important question as well. This T this is something that confuses a lot of people, Paul. T max is not the burial temperature. It's it's a technique of what they call rocky valve pyrolysis. So when I say a T max of 425 degrees C, that's not the burial temperature. That corresponds to a thermally immature rock. And that 425 would correspond to burial temperature less than 60 degrees. Because what they're actually doing is, it's a technique that was developed by the oil industry. You have to heat up to higher temperatures to overcome the shock reaction time in the lab because we can't wait around for geologic time for that to happen. So the, the Tmax scale on rocky valve pyrolysis is high temperature and it's correlated to burial temperature. But 425 is actually thermally immature and it would correspond to maximum burial temperatures of about 60 degrees. Thank you. Okay. Okay, with that, it doesn't look like we have any more questions. And I know Gordon needs to get to other things today. So, um, Big thanks, Gordon. This was okay. this was great, and it seems everybody was really appreciative. Um, so with that, uh, everybody, next week is our last one of the year, and then until we re uh, return with with Paul in in January. So we'll have a talk next week by uh, by Jeff Moyen, um, and uh, it's titled. Let me find it. Oh, I switch around my. Uh, tabs and lose things. Um, but it was something along the lines of what do we really know about Archean tectonics and uh, Archean tectonic regimes. So uh, don't join in for that next week for, uh, um, to, for him to take us out for the year. Um, until then, everybody stay safe and, uh, and see you next time. Thanks, Gordon. Great talk. Thank you. Thanks, Alex.